Built upon the site of prehistoric Indian pueblos stands the historic old town of Santa Fe, capital of New Mexico, and the oldest capital city in the United States. It was discovered in 1610 by Spanish explorers who named it Santa Fe, or the City of Sacred Faith, although it was nothing more than an abandoned Indian pueblo when they discovered it. In the heart of the city may be seen the old palace of the governors, over which the stars and stripes now wave. Erected before the pilgrims landed in America, it was the official headquarters of Spanish, Indian, Mexican, and American authorities until 1909, and it is now a museum. Even the modern buildings in this colorful city are consistently in the Santa Fe style of architecture, which was developed in New Mexico by combining features from the terrace dwellings of the Pueblo Indians, the Franciscan missions, and the Mexican Spanish haciendas. A good example of this unique architecture is this museum, housing interesting relics of the past, gathered by archaeologists throughout New Mexico and the Southwest. The Santa Fe Presbyterian Church is the first modern Anglo-Protestant church to be erected in the New Mexico style of architecture, and it has a motley congregation of English, Spanish, and Indian worshipers. About 70 miles from Gallup, New Mexico, at Chetro Kettle, the students of the State University and the School of American Research are unearthing relics and skeletons in an effort to determine when the Indians first inhabited New Mexico and where they came from. Already these students of archaeology have discovered that Chetro Kettle was an ancient communal dwelling which housed about a thousand inhabitants whose manners and customs were remarkably well advanced. Not far from here, in Chaco Canyon at Pueblo Bonito, we find indisputable evidence of a people who flourished more than a thousand years ago and developed a system of government as well as a drama and a religion so far advanced that they would have made a praiseworthy contribution to history had they succeeded in developing a written language. No less than 1,200 Indians resided here in terraced homes that rose four stories in height. The circular rooms, called kivas, were devoted to religious purposes. Even in ruin, Pueblo Bonito stands as a tribute to the architectural skill of a prehistoric people who were deprived of the benefits of modern engineering. In interesting contrast with this deserted ancient city of ruins stands the Pueblo at Taos, where a modern Indian civilization expresses itself through unique architecture and living conditions. It is said that no Indian of Taos chooses to be away from this village overnight, it being a superstition among them that evil will befall him who remains away during the hours of darkness. Indians still constitute about 7% of New Mexico's population, and they are given the benefit of the best in modern education and medical science. But in spite of modern influences, they live their lives in partial seclusion from the white man's world, and the majority of their children are brought up to inherit and practice by preference the primitive manners, customs, and superstitions of their forefathers. Although their white neighbors living in the town of Taos build stairs inside their houses, the Indians in the Pueblo still use the outside ladders invented by their ancestors. And from the roof of the chief's dwelling, the sentinel still calls the laborers in from the fields or hunting grounds, while the ever busy squaws prepare their cooking in primitive ovens. Customs as old as time, but still adequate in the life of the red men of New Mexico. Bordering the town of Taos stands a replica of the former residence of Kit Carson, famous Indian fighter who is called the Monarch of the Plains because of his great courage and success in conquering hostile Indians. Carson died at the age of 59 years, and his grave is now one of the sacred shrines of New Mexico. Situated upon a high and rocky mesa stands the Pueblo of Acuma, the oldest continuously inhabited village in the United States. During the revolution of 1680, 
In a retreat from Spanish bayonets, seven Indians were cornered on the famous Rock of Acoma, and all jumped off the cliff save one who lived to tell the tale. The construction of this ancient Pueblo necessitated the transportation of huge stones and building materials by Indians, who were obliged to carry or drag their heavy loads from the valleys below after walking 50 miles or more for their cumbersome requirements. Under the guidance of Friar Ramirez, a Franciscan priest, the Indians of Acoma built this famous mission, the completion of which dates back to the year of 1629. And now we come to a part of old New Mexico, which has been set aside for the benefit of the Navajo Indians, the most active and prolific tribe in North America. Even in arid country, the Navajos seem to thrive and prosper as they are naturally industrious and resourceful, living in a semi-nomadic condition. Over their 14 million acre reservation, they graze their flocks of sheep, from which they derive no small amount of their food and wearing apparel. In this compact setting may be seen the evolution of a Navajo rug from sheep to loom. An interesting feature of this rug making is the preparation of the wool which comes in three natural colors, black, brown, and white. The gray color is cleverly made by blending the black and white wool together. No race of people on earth have the art of weaving blankets and rugs more highly developed than the Navajo Indians, who derive inspiration for their designs from the manifestations of nature and the symbols of their tribal religions. As it was in the past and probably will be in the future, the squaws of today seem to do the major portion of Indian labor, while their enlightened men enjoy the inherited prerogative of leisure. And here is Jimmy B. Gay, who particularly enjoys a good book and the admiration of a countless number of young Indian maidens, any one of whom would gladly devote her life to his comfort and well-being. And here is the Indian Reservation School in which Jimmy B. Gay learned to read and write. But white man's learning doesn't seem to have made much headway with the Indians, who still prefer the great open spaces and the laws of nature for their maximum pleasure, even as their forefathers did in the golden days when they roamed freely beneath the clouded skies of New Mexico and all the world was theirs.